You know, JJ, 4th of July is right around the quarter, and I, I know you're a real smart eater, so are you even a hot dog guy? Oh, look, I, everyone likes hot dogs, don't they? Everyone has to, like, enjoy hot dogs to some degree. Now, how many hot dogs should you eat? That's the question. But yeah, everyone enjoys a hot dog. You're not going to go uh, Kobayashi on us? I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big glizzy guy. Love a dirty water dog. Love a sabrette. If you put a ballpark on the grill, I'll be happy with it. Again, yeah, like you said, I'm not too picky. What I will say, however, is that if you put ketchup on your hot dog, throw it out. Okay? Ketchup doesn't belong anywhere near hot dogs. In fact, if you plan on doing that, just go warm up some dino nuggets because you are a child. Start the show, get out of here. I'm JJ and I've been playing in best ball leagues for years, but there are people out there who play a lot more than I do. And there are people out there who have won a lot more than I have. And I want to learn from them. This season, I'll be documenting my journey of max entering underdogs best ball mania contest. And I'll be doing so with guidance from some of the most successful best ball players on the planet. This is the year where things start to change. This is the year where I officially become a best ball bro. Welcome into another episode of Becoming a Best Ball Bro. I'm JJ Zacharyson, and as always, I am joined by my apparently ketchup-hating co-host, Rich Ryan. Rich, what's going on, buddy? I mean, it's just tomato and sugar. It's for children. Grow up, get some spicy mustard, people. Look, I, I'll say this. I didn't really love ketchup growing up that much, uh, and which was kind of uh, a, almost borderline illegal in the city of Pittsburgh, where, where yeah, Heinz right? is, is, <laughs> was created and headquartered. Um, but yeah, I mean, like ketchup's good. I don't really eat that much ketchup in general these days, so I you know don't have that fire of a take. But to say that ketchup doesn't belong on hot dogs, is it, it's a take. It's definitely a take. I mean, don't step foot in Chicago, JJ. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, man, I, uh, I I definitely, definitely think that people are going to disagree with that. Anyway, let's talk a little best ball, man. Uh, have you been have you been doing some of the puppy twos? The the puppy two drop. Did the puppy two drop last week or two weeks ago? Right before record uh, last week on okay. day, it uh, it dropped. I had a wave of slow drafts end uh, close to two dozen. And then I once those ended, tw- I, fi- I figured 20 is is my my comfort zone right now. So as soon as those ended, I regged uh, 20 puppies. I think I got the second pick in like six of them. Nice. So I was uh, randomizing a bit between the receivers because I didn't just want to go CD every time. I did get CMC at one of them because CD did uh, go with the 1.1. And with one of them, literally my first draft this whole summer, uh, I went RBRB RB, uh, at the end of the first round. And uh, like the avalanche that you incurred yesterday uh, on yeah. Beach Stream, I am anticipating getting buried in the next couple of rounds. Yeah, that was that was rough. I did a, a, a live stream over on Pete Overzet's YouTube channel, uh, Overzet, on this show last week. And I did a BBM draft with him and we went Bijan at like 109, I think it was. That was the spot we were in. So he fell a little bit past ADP. And I'm very, very into, as I talked about last week, you know, and I'm still focusing on that now, very, very into getting sort of a hero RB type build right now, or at least not going super, super wide receiver heavy. And by that, I'm talking like, you know, six wide receivers through seven, even five wide receivers through six. I'm trying to avoid a little bit to get some of that differentiation. I talk about that with our guest later today. Um, and so going Bijan at 109, I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And I, I've been doing a lot of puppies. I, I am trying to, especially after talking to, to Herzig a couple of weeks ago, where Herzig said that he's only done one best ball mania draft. And it was at the very beginning of best ball mania and the start of best ball mania. I'm trying to slow down best ball mania. I have a couple slows that are coming to an end, but I haven't entered a best ball mania in probably over a week, maybe 10 days or so. Um, and I've just focused on getting as many puppy two entries as possible. Um, I think right now I'm, I'm in slow draft hell right now. I I'm in, <laughs> I think like 120 slow drafts right now as, as we, uh, as, as we speak. So I'm in a lot of puppies. If you guys see Jagers uh, in the streets, uh, I wouldn't be surprised because I'm in a lot of these puppies, but you know, I've been so used to drafting in the puppy where there 
are, I'd say it's a little less wide receiver heavy, like a little less wide receiver heavy. Not it's, it's still wide receiver heavy, but not as wide receiver heavy as what we see in best ball mania. And so when I'm like, yeah, we're going Bijan in the first and then that avalanche just continued and didn't stop. I think our team, honestly, chat was not very into that team. I didn't think it was that bad. I, I really like when I looked at it structurally, when I looked at the players, I even mentioned to Pete, the five running backs that we got are very JJ running backs this season. It was like Bijan, Najee Harris. I know Kamani Vidal was in there. I can't remember the other two that we had drafted, but or J- Jaleel uh, McLaughlin was one. And then one other one that I draft pretty frequently. So like the running back room, I loved. Um, and then the wide receivers, I thought, you know, were fine enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't hate the team as much as others did, but it was really tough to draft in that room with the, with the wide receiver avalanche. Yeah. And by the way, people, it's tough when you're on stream, you're trying to be entertaining. I know you too, JJ, because it's Pete's entry. I know you want to do the best for Pete. So you have that added pressure on you. Like it's not easy. And I think you guys, had you, uh, been able to get that, uh, Gino Fant, uh, to come around, yeah. but unfortunately the the one point one was able to snag him on the turn there. I, th- I yeah. think it would have looked a lot different, but yeah, I think you yeah. guys acquitted yourself just fine. Yeah, it was it was fine. Like I I, I did in that draft, and, and like we even looked back after the draft was over and said where would we have changed our picks? And I didn't I couldn't find a spot because you know we took Sam Laporta in the fourth, and it was like Sam Laporta or George Pickens. I'm taking Laporta all day long in that spot. Like objectively, even in a wide receiver heavy draft, because. I'm not going to just teardrop and and go to the next tier when I have that potential for an elite tight end. And that's, you know, uh, that was one spot where we uh, went non wide receiver. We went Anthony Richardson in the, in the fifth, I believe, because we had Michael Pittman. And so that was a spot where we didn't go wide receiver. Um, But, but where we drafted those players, the wide receiver alternatives were basically a half round later than what you typically get in those spots. So, you know, I wasn't that upset about the individual picks that we made, you know, the, it was a, it was a tough room. The lineup came together at least to some degree from a correlation standpoint. Hopefully, you know, some of these guys just outperform their expectation. Yeah, I'm looking now. You got Laporta like six picks after ADP and against Pickens there. I think that's that's an easy click. When you go to RB one tight end, how is that working? That is that is a very brave build, but given the some of the situations and the discussion about elite tight end, how are you feeling after you do? even uh two RB one tight end. Yeah, I, I think that you can get away with it right now. Um I it depends on where you're at in the draft, but something that I've really done a lot in the puppy, at least, is when I have a top three pick, and I've mentioned this last week a little I think it was last week, but when you have a top three pick overall that slot, uh oftentimes you can get the uh, get a stack in the four five range, in the four five turn range. So Uh, let's say that you're at the 403 and you reach a little bit for a Hollywood Brown, let's say, uh, or Travis Kelsey just falls, which sometimes happens too. If you can get Kelsey, you know, in the third to last bit, you know, at 410, then you just do that. But, uh, you know, if you're getting Hollywood Brown there and you're reaching a little bit, the, the teams that are next to you, uh, in the 101, 102 spot, they often will not go after Patrick Mahomes, right? And so you can take advantage of that when you're, when you're, and you should do that in your season long league too, where I love picks in like the 10, 11 spot or like the three, four spot in general, like not necessarily like individually this year, but just in general, right? Because you can dictate the room so much easier because there aren't that many factors at play with the other teams that are drafting after you, right? If you're in the 111 in a 12 team league, you know what you're playing against. And so you can extract a little bit more value by getting two extra picks out of, you know, the, the a, a certain player knowing that the team next to you needs a certain player or needs a certain position. And so you do the same thing in best ball where if there's a 101 or a 102 and they don't have any Chiefs players, not that you would in that position unless you drafted Hollywood Brown in like round three, but if I get Hollywood Brown a little bit before ADP, they're probably not going to force it at Patrick Mahomes. And this is exactly what I talked about with Lamar Jackson and Mark Andrews last week. And it's, it's, it comes to fruition all the time where Lamar standalone will go earlier than Mark Andrews. And I think part of that is the forces of Zay flowers, right? He's just going a little bit earlier because people who get Zay at the end of the third force it a little bit, maybe with Lamar at towards the, the, the front half of the fourth. But if that doesn't happen, 
then you can get Andrews in the fourth round and reach for him a little bit, which I think he should be valued there anyway. Get Mark Andrews there, and then it comes around in the fifth. People aren't going after Lamar Jackson because it's a naked Lamar Jackson. You could do that, but you're then left with Rashad Bateman and Tez Walker, and you're not feeling as strong, or Isaiah Likely. You're not feeling as strong about Lamar Jackson and that stack. So uh, I'm often doing that, and I'm doing that a lot in these puppies where I'm getting an elite tight end or I'm getting a player like a Hollywood Brown, and I'm really focusing on getting you know Lamar, Mahomes, those two in particular are are easy go tos. And Mahomes recently, I've gotten him with Kelsey in a, in a handful of drafts because I'm getting Kelsey, you know, slipping a little bit into the mid second, which I think he should be going where Laporta goes. And then I'm getting uh, Mahomes plenty then in, into the fifth. It's such a good point. One of the biggest leaks I think I've had in doing some of these slow drafts is that I'm not like fully zoned in. Like when I do mm-hmm. a fast draft, I'm there, I'm seeing everything, I'm seeing the picks. Yep. But when I'm doing slow drafts, I need to make a better habit of just clicking that grid tab because yep. especially on the corners, when you see what's coming up, because maybe they don't need a quarterback, like you said, maybe they don't have any correlation with a with a player that I'm thinking about picking that I can get on the comeback instead of taking them with that pick. So it's a that's a, a very that, important point. It's when, a when, really, really, I just want to say, it's a really, really good point that I've wanted to bring up on the show for a while is fast drafts. I actually think that I'm better at. And the yes. reason for that is because of focus, you're zoned right? In. Yeah. You're, you're just in, that's the thing that you're doing unless... You know, I'm doing a draft while I'm like trying to do the dishes and like taking care of the kids and stuff like that. <laughs> but but regardless of that, like I feel so much more confident in my builds when I'm doing fast drafts, which is another reason why I kind of want to wait and just do a lot of fast drafts with Best Ball Mania. I look back at some of my slows and when you're when I'm drafting a, like I don't mind doing a bunch of slows for the puppy because, you know, it's it's not the stakes aren't as high and it's it's good to get reps and stuff like that. But when it comes to Best Ball Mania, where it's their biggest prize pool, uh, you know, it's it's the biggest contest that I'll probably be entering, and I'm max entering that. I'm probably going to want to do more fast drafts than than slow drafts. And I was doing a lot of slow drafts uh, with BBM. I, I think I've done like 35 BBM drafts, and probably only seven of them have been fast. And I think I need to flip that ratio completely. Now that means a lot of drafting over the next two months. Um, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. We talk, I talk about that with our guests today, but, uh, I do think that's a really, really important point to bring up is that when you're doing fast drafts, you're way more focused, slow drafts. You're not taking as much time, even though you have that time. Yeah. You're, you're so just weird. trying to you get got, through you got that eight hours to make the perfect yeah. pick to do all the research. And yet I feel the exact same way. I feel mm-hmm. a definite lack of focus and I'm just not as locked in. Yeah, I agree. I agree, man. So when you're taking these these two RB bills, is is it built? Excuse me, is it always a five six running back roster? You're never going more than six. I'm assuming if you're taking two oh, this I, early. If I go two that early, it's almost always five. Um, nice. I haven't had many th- uh, four running back builds, but um, I think you can get away with that if you spend a lot of capital. Like if you do get CMC and Achan, and then you get like a Najee Harris or something like that in the middle rounds. I think that you could hypothetically get a Jaleel McLaughlin and be done with with those four running backs, right? Um, I've been going five running back a lot whenever I do go with two. Most of my builds, though, I'd say, uh, and we'll talk about some of these guys in a second individually, but most of these builds, I'd say, I'm going with one running back in the first four rounds. Um, maybe into, Maybe I'll get one in round five if I don't get one early, but I am trying to squeeze in a running back because... I also, you know, with the wide receiver heavy stuff, I also just like the flexibility late. You know, I like if I miss a stack, you know, and I'm, I have these really good six or seven wide receivers, I don't really want to waste a roster spot on another wide receiver. And now it's a lot more difficult to stack with that, you know, late round stack. And so I'd almost rather just have a balanced roster to be able to be flexible later in the draft. All right, let's get into players. First player, I'm very happy to see. We just finished, uh, you and I, I think it, the the Poodle, um, the Poodle Slow Wave is just wrapping up. And uh, we just finished a draft together. And in it, I had a non-quarterback Jags and Titans stack. And one of the players in my stack is the elder statesman, DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, I wonder, I, I'd be funny to see if my team was actually good in that. Because some of my teams, <laughs> like some of them end up being horrible. Like realistically, I For like sure. people are going to see my name opening. out there. I hate opening some of the drafts. And I'm just like, you said, I think you said yeah. this episode one, where it's just like, this team is drawing stone. Oh, dead. yeah. 
Yeah, right. Like I have no quarterbacks and it's like round 15. I'm like, what have I been thinking? Like, what am I doing right now with Bo Nix as my QB two? And like, uh, you know, some random like Aaron Rodgers is my QB one. Like I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. Um, but yeah, so, uh, Deandre Hopkins is someone who after doing work on the draft guide, I'm much more bullish on. I was always, if you look at my rankings, I've been ahead of market with DeAndre Hopkins all off season, but then I did uh, a lot of work on middle round wide receivers. And I know that middle rounds are different throughout every draft. And so in this year's draft guide, instead of looking at round taken, I'm looking at groups and clusters of positional ranks. So uh, middle round wide receivers are defined as wide receivers drafted at wide receiver 25 to wide receiver 42, right? That might be, you know, an underdog that's round uh, like early round (laughs) four through round six into round seven. But in your home league, it's probably going to be the middle rounds, which is like round six to 10, right? Um, And so DeAndre Hopkins fits in that, he's in that bucket where, um, you know, wide receivers in that range who are past year 10 of their NFL career or in year 10 or later, I should say, they've been really, really good from a hit rate perspective. And I think the reason for that, because I always need a reason. I don't want to just say like, oh yeah, there's there's correlation here. Clearly there's causality. Uh, I think with th- in this case, it's this survivorship bias where if a player is past year nine of their career, they're in the double digit uh, year of, of, of their career, He's probably good. He's if he's still being drafted in the middle rounds, he's probably a really good player, right? And so that's what DeAndre Hopkins is, where he's still being drafted where he's being drafted, you know, despite being past uh year nine. And then on top of that, you have another trend that exists where there's good hit rates from wide receivers who had good peripheral numbers the year prior in the middle rounds. And so he had a yards per route run last year that were that was above uh, 2.0. He had, a, he had a, a really good year from a peripheral standpoint last year. So right now what I've been doing, and I talk about this a little bit uh, later in the interview, but right now what I've been doing a little bit is if I get Calvin Ridley, even if I don't get Calvin Ridley, but I've gotten Ridley at the end of round five and I'll reach for DeAndre Hopkins at the beginning of round six to get that stack immediately. And, you know, it might differentiate my lineup a little bit because not a lot of people are going to reach that far for DeAndre Hopkins. And Nook is creeping into round six right now. He's up two spots in ADP week over week. And you think about the player. Nook was never a guy that was separating and burning people. He was always a massive catch radius. Throw the ball to him. He'll find a way to bring it in, which makes sense with him getting older. It's not like his separation diminishing is having a negative effect on him. Dude can just catch the ball if you throw it to him. So it, it makes yeah. sense that he continues to to produce at this age. We talked about him in the intro a little bit in that avalanche. Sam Laporta, with him dipping in ADP, you're getting more interested in the Lions tight end. Yeah, look, I was I'm not drafting Sam Laporta in the early and mid third round. I, I don't think that's good value. Uh, I think Travis Kelsey, I have Travis Kelsey ranked straight up above Laporta. Now with my rankings, I adjust for ADP and some other factors whenever I transfer them to underdog. And so Laporta is still ranked ahead of Kelsey, I believe. But I think with the with with Laporta's ADP falling and Kelsey's kind of staying the same, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Kelsey is is gonna be ranked ahead of him in my underdog rankings soon enough. But regardless. Uh, Laporta is finally going in that round four range. And, you know, there are times where, you know, it's a little bit difficult to do this, but there are times where I've gotten Gibbs and Laporta. And I say difficult because there's not as many strong wide receiver options as the alternative when you go with Gibbs and Laporta in that sort of area of the draft. But I've still done it to get that lion stack and to, um, you know, see what, what I can do with it. So uh, Laporta, though, finally falling, obviously has tight end one upside um, as, as a year two tight end, I'm finally drafting him more. Let's talk two running backs. One, two weeks in a row. I can't believe it, JJ. You're going to give Derrick Henry his flowers. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot of Derrick Henry recently in the puppy. I, I just, I kind of like the pocket where he goes in a wide receiver heavy draft. Um, you know, when when like a Tank Dell goes in the third, which you see pretty frequently, uh, even like a Zay Flowers and you're kind of at a wall, I'm okay with going Henry. And there's even been times where I have gotten Henry in the early fourth and then Andrews just slips and I'm able to get him past ADP to get a little Raven stat going. But even I, I think you could argue that going with Henry in the third and reaching for Andrews in the fourth could yield decent enough results. You know, I know that that's reaching hypothetically for, for Andrews, but I think that's where Andrews should go anyway. And then Henry that's at ADP for him. But yeah, there's a lot to like with Henry this year, uh, you know, in Baltimore, 
We know it should be a high powered offense. Uh, we know it's going to be advantageous run lanes. He's never been a pass catcher anyway, so it's not that big of a deal that he won't see a huge target share. Um, I just don't want to overthink it with Derrick Henry this year. I'm not going to be overexposed to him necessarily. I'd say I'm going to max out from an exposure standpoint with Henry at like 9%, maybe 10%. Um, but he's definitely on my radar. And the big decision that you have to make, which I talked about last week or the week prior, one of the two, is Derrick Henry versus Kyron Williams. And I do think I like Derrick Henry straight up more than Kyron Williams. Um, <clears throat> reason being, there's some trends that I talk about in the draft guide that don't favor Williams very well. With that being said, Williams is, he'll fall in drafts. Like you'll see him sometimes go in the mid third, which is not atypical, but uh, he will sometimes fall into the early fourth. And when that happens, I'm really okay in, in getting him because a lot of times in that area of the draft, I'd, I've either already gotten Puka Nakua or I've gotten Marvin Harrison Jr. And so I'm stacking him in that Rams Cardinals game for week 17. And then there are often times where, I mean, I know it's a probably a common start, but I'll go Puka, Marvin Harrison, Cooper Cup. And then all of a sudden Kyron Williams slips again. It's like, okay, I got the Rams three-headed monster. You know, sometimes you could go with like a Trey McBride there as well. But like when, when Kyron falls, that's when I'm getting exposure to him. I'm probably going to be underweight on him, but I am getting some exposure to Kyron Williams when that happens. Derek Henry, man, we've got, uh, uh, oh my God, Gus Edwards out here in LA. So he's gone. We've got Keaton Mitchell coming off of a major injury. We know what Justice Hill is. He's just a, a dude. So yeah, Rasheen Ali. Don't forget about Rasheen Ali. My, I'm, I will my, not my besmirch Rasheen Ali. Super duper uh, rookie draft sleeper this year that I have <laughs> on like 90% of my, my uh, dynasty teams. I think, well, it's interesting because I feel like Saquon and Derrick Henry are in very similar situations, yet one is being boosted way up, you know, on that Eagles offense, and mm -hmm. and Derrick Henry is being boosted way down. Both mobile quarterbacks who are going to score on the ground, yet I feel like one is getting denigrated a little bit more than the other. Another receiver, yeah. we've talked about him, rookie receiver up in Buffalo. You've still got some love for Keon Coleman. He's falling, man. I mean, he you can get Keon Coleman in like the late seventh oftentimes now when he was going in like the mid sixth in that like McConkey range for a really long time. The the bottom line with Keon Coleman, I don't want to overthink this. Like I, I, I want to have a very surface level stance with Keon Coleman. And that is he's an early second round wide receiver. We have to be open-minded about what will go down with these talents, right? Did I love Keon Coleman as a prospect? Uh, I thought that he was a little bit overrated, right? Like where he went, where my model did too, where he was drafted in the NFL draft, my model liked him a little bit less. Okay. There were red flags to his analytical profile. I do not think that he is, I like, I thought Ricky Pearsall was a better prospect than Keon Coleman was. Now, with that being said, I think we have to recognize that he's playing in an offense with Dalton Kincaid, who is good. Sure. But when have we been afraid of an offense that runs through a tight end when it comes to the other pass catchers on that team and how their ceiling looks in fantasy football. People, Every year I've seen we're the slobbering over ourselves to draft whatever KC receiver we think is going to lead that team in targets. Yeah. yeah, now look, look, like Buffalo last year with Joe Brady as offensive coordinator, they were a pretty run-heavy team, and I do think that you run into that a little bit with Coleman, but I've seen the takes of like, why is Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir going two or three rounds later than Keon Coleman the, the, the answer to that is that Keon Coleman has upside. Like, like sure, Curtis Samuel or Khalil, Khalil Shakir, one of them might pan out. Maybe one of them ends up being a wide receiver too this year. But I think when you're looking at like a reasonable range of outcomes, you have the unknown of Keon Coleman. It's okay to say this is an unknown and therefore there's a wider range of outcomes here. Like we do that all the time with anyone like there's a an unknown with lad mcconkey there's an unknown with brian thomas there's an unknown with younger players uncertainty though in the market is usually what drives really really strong values and so i don't want to lose sight of that i don't want to lose sight of the fact that first year you know rookie wide receivers do better during the second half of the season than the first i also want to lose sight of the fact that now that keon coleman goes in the later round later often will go in the later parts of the seventh round that's usually kind of where Josh Allen would be situated in the draft. It makes it a lot easier to stack that Bills offense with Keon Coleman and Josh Allen without you feeling like you're reaching for Coleman. Like, 
I talked to Leone, uh, but the guest today about this a little bit after uh, we recorded and I brought up Keon Coleman because he's a Bills guy. And one of the things that, that Leone said to me, and hopefully he doesn't mind me saying this, but it's like, and I think he said it very well, which is why I'm bringing it up. But he's like, when you look at those three wide receivers, which one would you bet on being a top three round pick next year? The answer is Keon Coleman. And I'm one of the biggest Khalil Shakir stands on the planet, right? I still recognize that Keon Coleman is the one with the most upside. So I'm just, I'm a little surprised because in that range, you just get to running back, running back land, right? You're just, it's only running backs for like four straight rounds. And every once in a while, you're like, oh, I guess I got to get Tyler Lockett. I guess I got to get Rashid Shahid. But we're now getting another option at wide receiver, which is Keon Coleman because he's falling so much. Yeah. Is it going to be the guys who run drags and crossers and get touches in the backfield or the guy that can run, you know, a 20 yard post and make a play downfield, you know? Yeah. It's definitely probably more likely. And look, to be, yeah, yeah that's the thing. Like, I don't mind Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir as players at all. I just, you know, it's, it's, it, it's taking a lot for me to think that of those three, one of those other two, that's not Keon Coleman is the one that's going to see the 20% plus target share. Like we don't have much evidence of that. So I don't know why we would bet on it. All right, before we get to Leone, I have a selfish question. I added this to the show sheet last because, JJ, I always find myself in round 17 and 18, and maybe there's no correlation picks out there to be made, and I just want to throw some darts. I want to take some guys that aren't at that exact ADP. I want to differentiate my builds a little bit. So are there any guys in round 17 and 18 that you're going off the board for and clicking in these drafts? Yeah, I don't know about like totally, you know, past like pick 215 or whatever when when ADP just starts to not matter. But, uh, you know, one guy, this is definitely someone that I'm getting in Lions stacks, but I think that you could argue even outside is Khalif Raymond because he just consistently gets some work. He's a big play threat. He seemingly has a couple big games a year. Um, and so I think that he could be, you know, a viable, he's not, he's not going to be a wide, he probably won't even be a wide receiver four from a season long perspective. But um, I do think he can give you those spiked weeks. That's one Darius Slayton's another one where there's not that much competition in New York. Uh, I think he's going to play the perimeter for them and and be, you know, opposite of, of Malik neighbors. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's an offense that you don't really want to heavily invest in, obviously, because it doesn't look that great on paper, but that's why he's being drafted where he's being drafted. So Slayton, another big play guy, he's, he's able to stretch the field, get down the field. Um, Jalen Hyatt last year didn't show that much. I, I have... Basically, I have some fear about Jalen Hyatt as a player because as a prospect, he did a lot what he did when he won the Bolitnikoff. He did a lot what he did out of the slot at Tennessee, and then they didn't throw him in the slot last year because that's really Wondell Robinson's role in that offense. They didn't throw him in the slot last year, and he, he really was bad. Like, he had a bad year. Now, there's been talk about him seeing the slot a little bit more, but uh, that team seems to have players that can already be there and play there, so I worry about sort of the role that Jalen Hyatt is going to play. So I think Darius Slayton in turn becomes someone who can give you some spiked weeks. Jalen McMillan, another guy that I'm throwing darts at. Uh, I think that he's a really good prospect. Uh, One of his three comps in my model was actually Amon Ross St. Brown. Um, Now don't take that to the extreme. I don't think he's going to be Amon Ross St. Brown, but he's very, very capable out of the slot. I think he can also play on the outside, maybe be like a 50, 50 inside out kind of like what we've seen with like a, Keenan Allen throughout his career, but even like an Amon Ra where, where ARSB will play in the slot a lot, but be able to play on the outside. Um, you know, there's contingent upside if something were to happen to, to Godwin or Evans. Um, I do think Godwin's going to play. They've talked about this. He's going to play a little bit more in the slot this year, but McMillan, a really, really good prospect profile. And Trey Palmer, you know, last year, and people were on him entering this year a little bit, but he didn't have, you know, granted, he played with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, but like his per route numbers were, were pretty atrocious. Like they were not very strong. So I'll bet on the, the rookie talent above that. And then some some late round running backs. Uh, I've been trashing Zamir White a little bit over the last month. So I'll just throw the dart at Alexander Madison at times. I know that sounds really, really ugly, but you know, if I'm not going to be that in on Zamir White, then I should probably bet a little bit on the backup, even if I don't think the backup is that talented either. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, if there is a dead zone ba- or a dead zone back when they don't uh, perform, it's just a hodgepodge of these random running backs that end up do performing. So I think you could hypothetically give us, uh, you know, a few usable weeks. Uh, the two that I target a little bit more, though, Clyde Edwards Alaire. I just think he's the direct handcuff to Isaiah Pacheco. And then Deontay Foreman, who, you know, Nick Chubb coming off a devastating knee injury. Uh, Jerome Ford was never the and I talked about this on the show. 
never the bell cow in that offense, even when Nick Chubb was sidelined. So I don't know. I don't really understand the hype with him so much because yeah, he has some big playability, but we already saw the, what Jerome Ford was able to do, you know, as a standalone back and it, you know, it was like low end RB two production uh, Foreman though, could be the early down guy. I mean, like while Nick Chubb is sort of rehabbing and getting back uh, Foreman could be the goal line guy um, and, and see some work in that offense. Um, so I'm, I'm throwing that dart a little bit with him, especially if I get like a Miami stack and, you know, I didn't get Amari Cooper and I'm not like amazingly high in like Elijah Moore and which, you know, sucks to say. And, uh, you know, Jerry Judy is fine. I'm not like high or low on him, but if I can't get those guys, I like bringing it back with Deontay Foreman. Jets legend, Elijah Moore. Yeah. Ford had his chance last year. He had his chance to be a league winner last year and yeah. Fumbled the bag for all of us in fantasy. Uh, it's it's that we're it, the, the Jerome for. Ford. Yeah. The Jerome Ford stuff's been really strange to me because a lot of people are like really high on him. They're like, Oh, he's such a value. He's such a value. And it's like, I, you know, I want a, like, I, I want, I understand the idea of just getting production and, and, but I don't see the difference between the getting production with Jerome Ford versus like a Rico Dowdle or some of the other, even some of the rookies in that range. I just, I don't think it's as like, like, and I don't think the ceiling is there with Jerome Ford either because of what we saw last year and how they divvied up that backfield. I'd rather gamble on Chubb coming back from an ACL than on Jerome Ford. Yeah. And Ford, Ford also, if you look at his like advanced numbers, uh, he wasn't very good at gaining like positive yards and stuff. He can look, he can generate big plays and you'll look at the highlight reel stuff and he looks explosive and he is explosive, but that only goes so far. I mean, there, there, there's a reason why uh, Cleveland was not just giving him that backfield consistently week in and week out. All right, we just talked rounds 17 and 18. You had a very good discussion with Mike Leone about weeks 15 and 16. He had a big thread about it uh, on Twitter, and I'm, I'm very excited to hear what he has to say here. Yeah, talk to talk to Mike Leone, a good friend of mine from Establish the Run. Back-to-back Establish the Run guests, if you guys listen to late round perspectives last week with John Daigle. Um, But Leone and I, we talked about game stacking week 17. Like you said, we talked about the optimal time to draft, you know, when you should be drafting. If you are doing like best ball mania, for instance, Uh, the importance of getting ADP values, just a lot, a lot of good information. Leone does a lot of digging with this data for underdog drafts. You guys will definitely learn something. Let's just get to it. Here's my chat with Mike Leone. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. There's no better place to play best ball than at Underdog. There are leagues starting all the time, and you can choose whether you want to do a slow draft or a fast one when entering one of those leagues. And you don't just have to play best ball mania to play best ball at Underdog. There's a wide variety of contests to choose from. You can even check out Underdog's other games as well, like Pick'em. Right now, you can get in on the action with a deposit offer and free copy of the late round draft guide just by signing up and depositing. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog app. When you sign up, use promo code late round and make a deposit for a deposit offer and a free copy of the late round draft guide. That guide will then be emailed to you when it launches on July 1st. Again, that's promo code late round. Now back to the show. Leone, man, you've been on the late in the late round podcast feed, arguably maybe more than any other human aside from myself. I guess Rich Ryan, who's now co-hosting Becoming a Best Ball Bro, his voice has been in there more frequently because he's on every single Best Ball Bro episode. But you're probably the most frequent guest because you've done, I remember way back in the day, you did a Best Ball episode on the late round podcast. You've done late round perspectives. And now... We're going to sit here and talk a little bit more about best ball and do the best ball bro thing. Uh, You've been doing a lot of work over on Establish the Run. And the first question I want to ask you is, with all of that research that you've done, and I know that you've dug into this a little bit, but, you know, right now I'm in the midst of, I've done probably 30 to 40 best ball mania drafts. Uh, I'm going to max enter. I'm going to get the 150, but I've slowed down a lot over the last couple of weeks, partially after talking to Justin Herzig a little bit where he said that he's only done one because he's just waiting to get all of his in, you know, in that late July into August uh, time frame. And so, you know, I've just been focusing on the puppy recently. My question to you is, should we be doing best ball mania drafts where they span, you know, the entire summer where, you know, they begin in May end in August. Uh, should we be sort of skewing our drafts towards the August date as opposed to May and June or 
is it okay to do it in May and June because there's the possibility for some crazy, crazy ADP values? Yeah, it's a somewhat complicated question. Like, I think my first instinct is just say, like, everybody's goals are different. Like, Herzig is drafting so many best ball teams across so many different formats that he can say, I'm going to do best ball mania where I think it's like the absolutely optimal time because I'm drafting all these other best ball teams right now. I'm drafting like a higher percentage of my portfolio will be best ball mania. And in order to max it, I'm kind of just entering when I can, you know, realistically, like, so from a fun perspective, like I'm okay with just people playing when they can. Now, if you're looking at exactly what's optimal, I do think waiting until late July, early August is probably your sweet spot where there's a little bit more information known so that you're not wasting late round picks. Um, you've also had less time to kind of get screwed over by injuries over the course of the off season. We learn more about players. So I think there's, it's like a good junction of like getting that information, but then also still having enough time that you can get a lot of closing line ADP value. So where you take players in July and August versus where their ADP finishes come September, there's just a lot more room for you to get really, really good values. Whereas if you draft late August, early September, right before the season, it's just gonna be hard to get a ton of value on your player takes. Yeah, I think the point too of just like being able to actually get the 150 in uh, like time wise yeah. is something that I'm kind of probably underestimating a little bit, you know, right now with this lull. I mean, look, I've already, like I said, I've done probably 40, so I'm not at that bad of a pace right now, but I do think that I have to flip that switch at least a little bit into July instead of just waiting until late July to get all of those done. Um, you, no, I just go got, you got to avoid slow draft hell come when they start reducing the timer towards yeah. the, the that. That's, that's a good point too. Yeah, that's the that's, mistake I made last year. Was I was like, oh, dude, I, like I went on vacation the beginning of August. When I got back, I'm like, I'll just like enter basically 150 slow drafts and I'll be fine. And I only got to 58 teams in Best Ball Mania, and like 10 percent of those teams reached the slow draft hell where like they have to fill it, make sure it fills the drafts finish before the start of the season. So they start cutting the timer down. That's a good point too, that this is exact th- folks. This is why I'm doing this show is because I don't think about the timers uh, changing. Cause I remember that happened, uh, you know, it happens before the NFL draft as well, where they want, you know, drafts to be finished before the draft, the NFL draft happens right. so that they can uh, fill those and make sure that you don't have any sort of advantage of knowing where guys landed for those pre-draft drafts. But then I remember it happening to me last year as well. Um, not to the scale of, of what you're talking about, but that is a very, very important caveat to remember. Um, now there's obviously other contests going on, on underdog that I've been focused on. Like I said, I've been doing a lot of the puppy too, to get reps. I'm probably at close to, I'm in slow draft hell right now, uh, with the puppy too. If I'm being honest with you, I probably have about a hundred going on right now. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a and lot. So, it's, it's it's definitely a lot. I wake up every morning and it's the thing that I have to do first uh, before taking care of my children. Uh, and so so that's not that's not totally true. Uh, I, my my question to you, maybe just a little bit. My question to you though is, are there any major differences in strategy that you would take uh, when you're looking at a a, a a structure like BBM versus say like a puppy, um, where you still have that week 15 to 17 playoff and both of these. Uh, tournaments in both these contests, but you know, maybe there are some things that you structurally change, or maybe there are some players that you would go after or not go after. Is there anything that you would change, you know, in your mentality when going from, let's say a BBM to a puppy too? So I think the overall builds for me are going to look pretty similar. You know, if you look at the playoff structure, it's not that dissimilar from best ball mania. You know, you still want to optimize for that week 17 final. Um, we'll talk about weeks 15 and 16 stacking, I think in a little bit, but like there's an element of that maybe not quite as important as in Best Ball Mania because the pod sizes are a little bit smaller in the puppy. The big difference for me is it's going to fill in such a short amount of time. And then that brings in some game theory stuff in terms of unique combinations and unique players that you might want to look at. I'm someone that in terms of Best Ball Mania, I don't like, let's say, to reach on ADP at the you know at the 2-3 turner, for example, to to get a combination that I don't think people are drafting because the ADPs don't align because over the entire summer, those ADPs might change. And then it's like, well, you got a really bad price. And now come the end of the summer, they're not even a unique combination. And that's bad. Whereas 
the puppy, like if that thing fills in a week or for example, you might have more confidence that you're getting a unique combination and those players aren't owned a lot together and that matters more. And same thing for players at the end of the draft where in best ball mania right now, round 16 to 18, I don't really care what the perceived ownership on these players is because chances are if I draft someone because I think they're gonna be super low owned, two things could happen. One, we get information on that player that is really positive and it's like, okay, you got maybe a little bit of value, but so many drafts are yet to happen and that player is going to end up not low owned by the end of the tournament anyways. Or we get negative information on the player. They stay low owned, but they stay low owned for a reason. So yeah. I'm waiting until like August in Best Ball Mania to worry about unique players. The puppy is totally different because you don't have that dynamic where if you get the positive news and you drafted low owned guy in the puppy, like you're home free because that player can't be drafted anymore because the contest is closed. So that that's like the main difference, some of the game theory with getting unique combinations and lower owned players on your roster. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, not just thinking about the top of your draft, but also the the tail end of your draft. I think I think the unique combination thing at the at the early parts of your draft is something that a lot of people brought up and talked about. But the tail end is something that people have not brought up nearly as much um, because you know the contest is going to close a lot sooner. And if you're able to get someone who then rises in July as opposed to June, then you're going to get really good value out of that player. But the the other thing I want to add to this about like the unique combination piece. Do you, is there a point in time where you're forcing that a little bit more in your drafts versus like, let's say you're at the one, two turn. Okay. And you get Jameer Gibbs as your 12th overall pick. And then the 13th overall pick is coming and, you know, you're staring at the typical Drake London, uh, you know, that sort of grouping, what, what maybe, maybe an Iuke or something like that. But are you, so, so instead you go after Debo Samuel and you're able to not only stack that, maybe that's a higher rostered, uh, and, and own stack just because the game stack in week 17. But regardless, let's say that you get a lower rostered one and you get someone that's more so on the tail end of round two, as opposed to the early parts of round two. My question would be, you know, something that I've done recently in the puppy is in round five, maybe I get someone like Calvin Ridley at the tail end of round five and then I want to stack him with DeAndre Hopkins, right? Where Hopkins typically goes like six, seven turn. He's rising a little bit, but, you know, typically let's say goes six, seven turn, you know, standard, uh, a normal draft. You're going to see him go in that range. But if I reach for him at the five, six turn, I'm getting a pairing in Ridley and Hopkins that also have that team correlation. So I can get Will Levis later or even just stack him with Jags or something for that week 17 correlation. Is that a point in time where you're still trying to force that in that like round five, round six range? Like, is there, you know, obviously this is more subjective probably. It's not like a clear, yeah. you know, at round seven, this is when you stop worrying about that. But do you think that that's something that we should be focusing on? Basically, have I been approaching that properly? Do you think with the Hopkins Calvin Ridley example? Yeah, I think especially in terms of correlation and stacking, you can always sacrifice a little bit of ADP value, especially if it's going to give you a unique combination. Um, it's tough to kind of like draw that line between like how much value do you give up versus yeah, like making on right. the correlation. But I think the correlated aspect of it gives you like an additional out to the uniqueness. If we're talking like purely unique combos, it's something I struggle with. I talked with Eric Bime for Spike Week on my Establish the Edge podcast, and he's a little bit more game theory than me. And I, I'm kind of boring the way, you know, I, I would just hate to like reach on combinations. And then like you, you mentioned that Debo Gibbs example. Right. You know, let's say Debo starts to fall over the course of the summer. He starts going to the end of three. Now you've you've got Gibbs Debo at the one two turn, and other people have it right. one better player. You know, Marvin Harrison at two and Debo at right. three. So uh, maybe towards the end of the summer, when those combos are set a little bit more firmly, and you can really be confident that it's going to be unique, you could do it. But the way I like to get unique, which is really boring, but like take advantage of ADP fallers when I can, even yeah. if it doesn't necessarily fit with the build that I'm doing. Um, you know, I have a Josh Allen Jordan love team that I just drafted and generally that's too much draft capital invested in the quarterback position. You wouldn't want to take Jordan love with Josh Allen, but I got Jordan love, you know, almost two rounds past ADP with a couple of green Bay pass catchers also past ADP. Now I'm looking at like the best possible version of a Josh Allen Jordan love team. So that's the way I like to do it. And in terms of like bully tight end, I think of this too, where um, I don't want to talk about tight ends a little bit, but like I'm happy to grab an elite tight end. I'm generally not trying to get two of those top seven guys, but there's instances where 
you know, I've got one of the top five or whatever, and George Kittle falls, you know, half a round, full round past ADP, and I'll take him as my second tight end. Um, okay. Then I start to get combinations that people probably haven't drafted a lot, but I got it at a really, really good price, which, you know, makes it better than other versions that people have of this, I guess. Yeah, I think I've been drafting like you where I like I'm not as comfortable forcing the differentiation of the combos as opposed to it's a lot easier for me to be like, oh, wow, this guy who usually goes in round four is going in round six right now. So, sure, I'll I'll snag him and just get sort of a differentiated figure lineup that yeah. way. Yeah, just figure makes out sense. the construction. Makes sense. Um, so speaking of uh, uh, correlated lineups, something that is a big, big talking point every year, but this year, I think even more so because uh, underdog sort of flattened the pay structure a bit in that final week in that championship week in week 17, where, you know, last year it was a little bit more top heavy. So it was a little bit maybe clearer for people to say, I'm going to optimize my lineups for week 17. So I'm going to get a lot of game stacks in week 17. My question to you, and I, I know that you have looked into this a little bit and you were tweeting about it this week. Um, should that still be the case? And do you think that there's any advantage to maybe not game stacking week 17 and looking more at these week 15, week 16 games to say, hey, look, if I can optimize here and just kind of get in the dance, not only could my EV be pretty strong because the payout structure is the way that it is, but maybe I even just get lucky in that week 17 game and I just have the right pieces, even if they're not totally correlated. Yeah. So the data is pretty clear that stacking in week 17 matters positively. If you can do it, you know, I simulated, I took last year's finalists for best ball mania four. And with the help of our data science team, like simulated that week, like based on our DFS Sims for that week to see like all the possible ways it could have played out, not just using the one way it did. And I used, but I used the best ball mania five payout structure, which you mentioned flatter. And even there, you start to see that the teams that have more correlation in week 17 have a higher average expected value for their teams in those simulations. So right off the bat, super clear that it matters. Now, the question is, does it matter that much more than 15, 16? Like the way people have talked about in the industry is like week 17 is all that matters. If you look at the actual data from last year, you can see that people went out of their way to set up stacks for week 17, but they didn't for weeks 15 and 16. So is that right or not? And as you mentioned, the payout structure changing matters a lot. Um, it's a lot flatter this year. I think if you finish top 20, you're going to get a six figure prize payout. Last year, and first place is one and a half million. Last year, I believe first place was three million and like, if you didn't finish in the top 10, it was like 10K for like right. 11th place, which is like a massive, massive swing. So the question then becomes sort of like, like if you could choose to improve your odds of winning any given week, like what week would it be is like question one. And then question two is like, how much influence do we actually have over improving our odds to win a single week? And if you could just improve a single week, Obviously, in real world, this wouldn't happen. Like, there's correlations and stuff. But if you could just pick one week to improve, you would want to pick week 15. Like, you'd rather increase your odds of winning week 15 by 50% than your odds of winning, you know, week 17 by 50%. Because that actually, the way the math works out, does not change your odds of winning that grand prize in week 17. Because you have to do that calculation before week 15. You know, it's your odds of winning week 15 times winning week 16 times winning week 17. Mm -hmm. That's the same regardless of which lever you pull. But if you do it earlier, you bank some of the prizes along the way. And like also with the flatter payout structure in week 17, just getting there is like a huge deal. I did look closer at which week you can influence more and stacking does affect to a greater degree your odds of like winning that one and a half million dollar grand prize uh in week 17 i think it's like first i think it's 539 people in week mm -hmm. 17 so when it's that big of a pool coming in first out of 539 the stacking matters more than let's say winning week 15 one out of 13 people right but when you extend it to like the full top 20 of week 17 the degree to which it impacts things is like very very similar like coming top 20 out of 539 is influenced by stacking very similar as coming in top one out of 13 in week 15 or top right. one out of 16 in week 16. So I think when it all shakes out, like week 17 is still the most important, but I think weeks 15 and 16 aren't that far behind. Have you been implementing that in your drafts or is this sort of like a newer discovery for you? Um, 
a little bit of both. Like I've been implementing it, but I'm probably going to try and implement it more. I think yeah. it's fun too. Like it starts to open up layers too, where if you, you start to find teams that have, you know, common opponents throughout the playoff weeks, you can kind of get two playoff stacks with one opponent. So yeah. there's things like that um, that you, you, you can mess with. I forgot who, I don't know if it was, was Philly and Dallas maybe. But if you check, you know, that that's something that, you know, you, yeah. you're starting to get really down the rabbit hole, but it does, you know, if you can build a week 17 stack and a week 15 stack, game stack at the same time with one pick like that's obviously the best yeah i mean look as someone who's becoming a best ball bro who has memorized the week 17 uh uh schedule it's a little bit tilting that i now have to worry about week 15 (laughs) and 16 when i just wasn't like it was in the back of my head but it definitely was not at the forefront in a lot of my drafts i would imagine though that if you're team stacking right because what you would be doing with a game stack right yeah so if you're team stacking i would imagine that i would look back at my lineups and just see some natural correlate game stack correlation anyway right like that's you're probably just going obviously to, gonna happen it happens more than you would expect for sure right. that you just naturally run into one of these stacks especially to like like if you've got a three team stacked like three quarterbacks all team stacked like yeah and they have six opponents between them for weeks 15 and 16 like odds are you have like one or two of those already but yeah it is it is something that's interesting especially with the field not i feel like the field feels like i have and, and you just said which is like in the back of our minds we kind of know it matters too but it's just so much easier to memorize that week mm-hmm. 17 schedule and then no one does mm-hmm. it so i do wonder if there's an element too of you know maybe it mattering a little bit more if people aren't doing it as much yeah like you've got you show up with these correlated game stacks but as you said, it still happens quite a bit. Um, you know, in the data on a generic week, like thirty-five percent of teams have like one one g- game stack set up. Yeah. On just yeah. a random week, and and almost ten percent have two set up. So, yeah. Yeah, and at the end of the day, like the individual team stack is more important than the game stack. Right? Like, like you should right right like you shouldn't be sacrificing team stack for game stack. Correct. Team stack always more important because that affects every week. Like you've right, got the exactly. correlation for all the weeks. So that's definitely top priority is completed. Like, like if you could make your first quarterback a game stack by drafting an opponent bring back, or you could add a pass catcher to your second quarterback who's not stacked yet, you would always want to stack that second quarterback before yeah. you worried about the opponent. Makes sense. Um, Another thing that I've been really wondering and wanted to talk to you about is drafting zeros late in your draft, right? So you mentioned uh, sort of differentiating a bit in like the puppy or something like that with your round 16 to 18 picks and, you know, maybe reaching a little bit or getting guys that just aren't drafted as highly. Um, How important is it, though, that we don't have zeros on our roster? Like, should we be avoiding rookies who have... Uh, maybe clear upside, but clear downside too. The, the, the easy example for me is a guy that I've drafted a lot and I've talked about this is uh, Kamani Vidal, right? So yeah. I like him as a prospect. I think the situation is, is right for him to at least give us a good number of spiked weeks uh, potentially. But then I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to look at things in a pretty level-headed way and I, I recognize that he's a day three back He's coming from a smaller program. You know, this could go south for him, right? Like he could realistically be a zero, but I also recognize the upside with Kamani Vidal. So to you, is that like, okay, you're weighing the upside downside risk. It's okay to draft him. Or are you like, no, we only have 18 slots in our lineup. There's going to be injuries throughout the season. By the time you hypothetically were to get to week 15, 16, 17, you need as many bodies as possible that are healthy on your team that are getting fantasy points. Like, Which which one of those two buckets do you fall into more? Yeah, I mean, I'm boring. I'm generally in the middle uh, with a lot yeah. of this stuff. And uh, zooming out, like it, that final simulation exercise that we went through, you know, teams that had, you know, 15 plus live players in the finals had a much higher simulated expected value and chances of winning than teams that had less than 15 live players. And it's like very, like each player you add, it's like a super clear trend line. There's no like yeah. weird deviations. It's like this, you know, in terms of live. So it certainly matters. The question is like, t- to what extent do we actually influence that versus luck? And I think, if you were to draft a you know a six running back team and you had Vidal, Ray Davis, Jalen Wright, Bucky Irving, that's probably too much, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, 
you're asking for a lot. On the flip side, we know that drafting rookies and breakout players is like one way to absolutely crush your ADP. And it's one of the best ways to possibly do that. So I think you just want to look at your room and like have a good mix of players, right? Like that yeah. team with four rookie running backs, like I probably would rather have like Rico Dottle, you know, instead of one yeah. of those guys, even though he's more boring just to like get some assured points, especially the start of the season to like even help with your regular season advance rate, let alone like having those live players come in week 17. And there is an interesting wrinkle with best ball where I think there's a tendency to look at it like it's best ball scoring. So I can draft all upside because I don't yeah. have to worry about my bench, but I found in a lot of ways, it's almost like the opposite. Like I care more about upside in these redraft leagues where I can just drop players and add players in best ball. You know, if a guy's on the field, you know, he can run into a good score for a week. Like if he has that role, um, you know, even if he is kind of a boring, like 10 points per game player, he can get you 16 when you really need it. So yeah. I really think you just got to look at the overall construction of your room. And if you have like no upside rookie picks, it's probably, you're probably shorting yourself on some upside, but if you've got like half your roster of those guys, especially at the running back position, uh, I've used these examples to death on podcasts, but Isaiah Spiller, Tyrion Davis Price, like those dudes we had pumped into like the 12th, 13th rounds, let alone yeah. like end of the draft. And they they were like almost drawing dead, you know, before yeah. the season started. Yeah. No, that that makes a ton of sense. I I I like what you said too about just getting guys who, you know, seem boring, seem like they're low floor players, but they still have spiked weeks. I've been trying to sort of articulate this in to, to folks over the last month or so when I've, you know, obviously started doing the show, but like, I think a good example of that is like Julio McLaughlin, right? Where like, like I, I think he's going to have a role in that offense. Now, obviously there's stuff going on in the Broncos. They have like five capable running backs right now. So you have to obviously worry to some degree about how that's going to shake out and you know, who's going to get cut and who's not going to get cut. But assuming he makes the roster, assuming he's on the roster, which I think we should make that assumption. Uh, he's someone who like, you know, doesn't necessarily profile to be, and even Kamani Vidal doesn't profile to be this like bell cow workhorse back. But I also think you have to take a step back and say, there's not really many of those players in general, even when they're pure handcuffs going that late in drafts. And so it's okay that these guys might be 10 point per game players, as long as you know, they're on the field and they're explosive enough to give you those big plays, which I think both of those running backs hypothetically are it's still okay to get that player. And I, w would you feel similarly then about someone like, I don't know. The first one that popped to my mind is like Greg Dortch, who let's assume again, this is, let's just assume that the roles are, are more concrete than they are here in June. Let's assume he's, he's uh, locked in to get the slot role in Arizona, right? Which a slot role, you know, with, with Trey McBride and Marvin Harrison on that roster is the target share really going to be as high as we think it's going to be. Is that someone that you're still okay with going after? Because even if he does have a 15% target share in the offense, there's still the possibility that he has a two touchdown game. Yeah. And I mean, if you look in past years, we had a year, you know, Cole Beasley as a slot receiver was one of the most important playoffs or players in best ball Hunter Renfro another year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the reason they dropped is like, what is really their upside? And it's like, well, they play every week and they get enough targets that <laughs> yeah. like they're always, they always can count to your score. And then they'll spike a few times more. Than you think so i'm definitely fine with that type of player i will say i treat like i'm more apt right now to take rookie wide receivers than running backs late where just like odds that they force their way on the field and good yeah. matter a bit more whereas running back like the death chart matters so much so i take a lot of like elijah mitchell and clyde edwards alaire at the very end of drafts where yeah like i'm very confident they're the rb2 going into the season and we talked earlier about you know when to draft as we get more information in july and august like i'll pay a premium on vidal if the news is really good like i'm still drafting right. now by the way but like i'm okay saying like okay like i didn't draft as many rookie running backs in june because i was worried about them like i'll pay the premium on the good guys because the draft capital from like the 13th 14th round versus like 16 to 17 isn't that right big deal i'm okay saying like okay i got all my exposure at a worse price but i got the guys that are worth getting and I avoided all the zeros along the way. Yeah, I found myself sort of gravitating towards those rookie running backs more in the truncated contests like puppy, right? Where we know it's going to fill, right. we know it's going to be like a two-week contest. And if I get those guys when they're 14th round picks and then they end up being 11th round picks, 
that's a win because other people in that contest aren't able to take advantage of them being 11th round picks. You know, they either got them or they didn't. Whereas best ball mania, I think what you're saying really makes a lot of sense because at the end of the day, if you can get Vidal as like, how high is his ADP really going to go? Right? Like, is it, is it going to seep into the single digit rounds? Highly, highly doubtful, especially in an environment where running backs go so late. Right? So, you know, if it's a two or three round difference at best, um, it's really not as worth it to, to reach for that player necessarily, at least be like heavily exposed to that player in that, in that contest. Let's talk about ADP value. Um, you know, if you're looking at a player and you're, um, you know, trying to sort of guess if he's going to rise or fall, uh, you know, right now versus in July, like Jonathan Brooks is a really good example of that where, you know, a lot could go south for Brooks um, or a lot could go north, I guess, for Brooks if, you know, reports are positive and he does end up uh, being sort of the bell cow for Carolina. How, how important is having that value in ADP, not just in a player who rises from June to July, but, you know, as you're drafting in July and in August and you're extracting as much value as possible out of every pick, does that matter or should we, quote unquote, just get our guys? Yeah, I think the player takes definitely matter. Um, I like to use ADP just because it's a bit more objective. Obviously, you have your ranks, the late round guides coming out. ETR has their ranks. And I think those things should matter too. But like just putting that aside for now, there's sort of like two types of ADP value. I looked at closing line ADP value. Basically, I assigned a draft capital number for every single draft pick based on historical data. So got that way, like getting... A half round value in round two is way more important than getting a half round value in round 18. So if you look at closing line, which is the ADP draft capital you get the player at versus where they wind up when the contest closes, it matters a ton. If you break that into 10 buckets, just every 10th percentile in terms of like mm-hmm. bucket one is the top 10% best teams by closing line ADP capital. Those teams had a regular season advance rate last year of 28%, which is a 70% increase over just based on randomness. The teams in the the last bucket, bottom 10, advanced 6.6%, which is minus 60%. And bucket two was 23%. Bucket three was 21%. That's still like a 25% increase over randomness. So it matters quite a bit. Now, a lot of that though is a combination of you know, we, we just talked about all those risks with, with some of those late round running backs, but there's also an upside component why you want to mix, which is like Kyron Williams gets hurt and Blake Corum now is actually like a round yeah. four pick. You know, right. it's not like the right. Vidal thing where you can only, you know, he's like yeah. an actual round four pick. So there's some of that. There's a little bit of pro to drafting early in terms of risk reward there. There's also just more time for your player takes to matter. Like you think Jonathan Brooks is going to be, healthier than the market thinks he's going to be early in the season. He becomes like a sixth, seventh round pick. Like that's a lot of ADP value that we're getting. Um, As far as the value in the room when you're drafting, it still matters, but like to no surprise by a lot less degree. And if you're in like the top three buckets of that, you increase your regular season advance rate by like 10 to 15%, which is still pretty good, but it's not, you know, 25, 40, 70% like it is for closing yeah. line ADP value. You really want to avoid being at the very bottom. Like if you're in bucket 10, it's minus, you know, you drop to 11.7% advance rate. That's minus 30%. If you're in bucket nine, it's 14.3%. That's minus 15%. So all this to say that it definitely matters. Your player takes matter, especially as they, you know, you see them mature over the off season. If you can be on the right players now that are going to skyrocket by the end of the season, it matters, you know, quite a bit. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and I, so I mean, what you're saying though too is that it's fine to reach at times in your draft. It's just that it's the accumulation of that value that you're really looking at, as opposed to that individual player. Like you can get guys ahead of ADP sometimes, even well ahead of ADP based on uh, how drafts are going, but you're looking at more of the the uh, aggregate and the accumulation of all of that value, yeah? Yeah, 100%. You're looking at the accumulation. If you're taking a couple spots like where guys are around ahead ADP, you're going to be fine. If you do that mm-hmm. with every single pick throughout the draft, 
you're fighting a pretty big uphill battle, you know? Yeah. Uh, part of that is like other people are getting better prices on these players. Part of it is like a little bit of respect for the market that like, you're probably not that much better than the market. Like if you're constantly right. going completely against it and part of it, just like getting lucky. Like I like two players in round four. I like, you know, this wide receiver a better than wide receiver B, but I might get wide receiver a in round five, like taking those right. gambles and like maybe getting a super team is more important than just locking in your guy, so to speak. So I think that's the way it is when you bring in stacking and correlation and stuff. I think like you can reach up to like a round and a half on guys, like assuming like the middle of the draft. So you're going to scale right, that right. less earlier in the draft where the picks are more of a premium later. It's like almost any reach for correlation past round 14 or so is totally fine. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a question that I've asked every guest, basically, it feels like that have come on becoming a best ball bro. How are you approaching tight end this year? Because I've said it and I'll say it again. I think tight end could end up being sort of the make or break uh, however you strategize around that position is going to make or break a lot of teams, in my opinion, this year. So how are you looking at tight end with these sort of decreased prices than what we've seen historically at the position? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I'm looking at the prices. Like, I don't think individually any of them are, like, really that far off what they should be. Like, if you look at the top seven tight ends, um, like, George Kittle is going, like, the same that he did last year, for example. Yeah. Um, so he hasn't been pushed down that much. And I think the guys that have been pushed down like Kelsey and Andrews, like there's reasons they've been pushed down. Sure, it's not sure. But at the same time, the fact that there's seven guys, like, like I kind of balked doing a podcast with Dwayne McFarlane when he said he's got like 70% elite tight end. I'm like, I think that's too much. But then if you're counting like the top seven, let's say you go to like Kittle and Kyle Pitts and like, don't count Evan Ingram. Let's say Evan yeah. Ingram's eight. Yeah. I mean, just on randomness, that'd be 68% of your teams. If you were like <laughs> yeah, neutral, you know, that if you were neutral exposure or 58, I'm sorry, 58% of your teams, if you were neutral right. exposure. So like 70% is not that cr like, I love Kyle Pitts. So like if I have 20% Kyle Pitts, I'm already at 70% if I'm neutral with yeah, the other guys. So the way I'm doing it, which is pretty boring. Um, but again, like one of those seven guys usually falls past ADP in your draft, whichever mm -hmm. one falls, I'm taking them. If Laporta falls to the three, four turn. I'm taking Laporta. Um, I think McBride and Kincaid in a vacuum are like a little bit overpriced, but I'm fine taking those guys when they slip past ADP, you know, get some minimum exposure. And then to the group as a whole, I'm going to have more than 70%. If I miss on those guys, I think the mid-tier tight end prices were expensive for a while. And those have like come back down yeah. to earth where I can get, you know, Goddard, someone we really like, like I can pair him with a Brock Bowers now, like, yeah, pr pretty easily. Very beginning, I did a few like full late round tight end teams, like three late round tight ends. You could possibly do four. I wouldn't recommend doing that a lot, but it's not like egregious if it was like your last four picks. But there's just not a ton of upside guys there. Two of the guys we liked the most were Jawan Johnson and and Tucker Craft, and they're, like they're already injured, and you know that takes <laughs> yeah. two guys out. Like we like Chiga Conquo a lot, but you know he might his snaps might be greatly reduced in this offense. Like you don't have the same level of, yeah. of players that you had last year. Like Ben Sinnott's ADP for a while was just like, everybody was like, well, Sam Laporta did great last year. So like, let's draft Ben Sinnott in like round right. 13. Like that's come back down to earth somewhat, but I don't know. I I'm not building as many three late round tight end teams as I was in the beginning of the off season, <laughs> just through the player pool and the prices. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily think that the tight ends at the top are egregiously priced. Like you can yeah, say right. that they're appropriate, appropriately priced, but still go with a heavy top seven tight end approach because of what's going on late. If you don't feel comfortable with what's going on late and look like at the end of the day, like one or two of those late round tight ends is probably going to emerge. Like that's what we just see every single year happen. Um, but I think the difference is that you know, you're, you're trying to look at it. Like we can, it's easy to say that it's easy to just be like, like, Hey, Trey McBride happened last year or this happened last year. But when you're facing the decision of which tight end to draft the denominator of that equation, you know, the numerator being I'm picking the guy, the, the player pool of, of available potential tight ends that could be that guy is very large. Right. Whereas early on in your draft, you have a pretty good idea of which guys are, are going to be good and which guys aren't going to be good. And so I think that yeah. has to play a role too. Right. 
Yeah, I think that absolutely plays a role. And the other thing I want to mention, like I know Peter Overset's done some content on this too, but like the single week upside of the tight ends in the playoff mm. format is maybe like hard to like fully price in. So like even if you think like on a season long nature, like these guys are priced appropriately, I do think there's probably a little bit of edge in in the playoff upside of the elite tight ends, which when I'm deciding between two players, like a tight end and a running back or tight end and wide receiver that I've ranked pretty similarly early, that generally ends up being my tiebreaker. We're like, I like these guys kind of the same. I'll take mm-hmm. the, the playoff upside of the tight end, just given some historical structural data that supports that. Yeah, honestly, too, and, and this is more of a feel take and subjective take, I kind of like my builds a little bit more and what they look like when I have that like round five, round six tight end, uh, like when, whenever the value does fall, because you're not, at, you know, you're not forced to use an extra roster spot on a third tight end. So you're able to use that roster spot, you know, on running back or wide receiver late. Um, or if you have a three, you know, it gives you more flexibility because if you, you might need a three quarterback build too, depending on how things sort of unfold there. And there's just seems like there's been enough running back value dropping, you know, throughout drafts because people are going so wide receiver heavy that, you know, you don't feel as lost if you go a little zero RB or hero RB, um, which is what I've generally leaned towards more so. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think just going with one of those guys just makes you feel a little bit more comfortable too, overall. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, there's a lot of builds this year, too, to your point about like when you get that tight end in five and six, like it's different in terms of how you can construct your team versus when you had to take, you know, Travis Kelsey at the one, two turn or whatever. Right. right. So, and obviously, Travis Kelsey was there for a reason. So it's not apples to apples. But in general, this year, if you can just, if you draft like three wide receivers in the first four rounds to make sure that you're not way behind, you can build teams that you couldn't in the path like you can almost do like what would be a hyper fragile running back team with an elite tight end and still like have drafted three wide receivers your first three rounds like yeah it's almost boring but like you can bad draft like balanced teams that like like you have it you can have a crack at having like the best at each position now like you can be the best at receiver tight end and running back in the same draft you can really do that before Yeah, that's been a big realization for me is that I was I went through a period probably late May into June, probably like a two or three week period where I swear all of my teams were zero RB teams. Like I I had like in the first seven rounds, I had six wide receivers almost like or five, at least five, like consistently. And what I've tried to do over the last couple of weeks, and I mentioned this on last week's show, what I've really tried to do is maybe just get to the four number at, at wide receiver through seven. Right. And, you know, maybe those wide receivers are, you know, two in the first two rounds and maybe one in the four, whatever. But I'm getting four wide receivers typically through seven. And the balance on that roster, like you said, you have a a real chance of getting the QB one, RB one, wide receiver one and tight end one all on your team. Like it's it's a a very real possibility when we knew that was just not possible in years past. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And like, I still think, like you said, those builds you were doing late May are like, totally on the table it just kind of like being more open to that value when it falls because yeah. i have some like six wide receivers out of the gate and you stop at six like those are fun <laughs> too and you can just yeah. like load up at quantity at the other positions but when yeah. like yeah i you know you know i like i like christian kirk a lot but like has his adp is like rising and rising it's like you know do i want to take christian kirk as a fourth wide receiver or you know trey mcbride as right uh, as the you know possibly best tight end yeah, exactly. That's that's been the decision, I think, for a lot of these wide receivers because all of them keep rising because we're in an environment right now, Leone, where everyone wants wide receivers and they're drafting them very, very early. I did a, a BBM live stream with with Overzet yesterday on his channel, and we were we we hit the we hit the wide receiver avalanche, and it was it was crazy because we went Bijan in round one at. 109 I think it was so like we got a slight value on Bijan which I would do all day like even after the fact like I still think getting Bijan there makes a lot of sense and then you know we start building wide receiver around it whatever um but it was a wide receiver heavy room and you get into those wide receiver heavy rooms and you feel a little bit uncomfortable because at some point in the draft you are going to have to reach around a round and a half on a wide receiver that you don't really want to reach for that guy for us was Tyler Lockett in that draft we we ended up getting Lockett you know, a round and a half before his ADP because we had we had no choice. There's such we a drop to... off after him too. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like you don't exactly. want to draft him, but you really don't want to draft the guys <laughs> yeah. after. You know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, my question to you though is: Do you think that the 
wide receiver love that's out there right now has almost gotten out of hand. Like, is 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 there anything that that data suggests that that tells you that we should be going with a more balanced roster, or you know, is this just a situation where you got to lean into it because everyone's doing it? So last year we saw the wide receiver ADP shift more significantly, I think, than every other year. And the data in terms of teams that made the finals, regular season advance rate, uh, if you, again, looking at things in buckets, so like investment in wide receiver by that AD, that draft capital metric that I mentioned, if you did it in five buckets, so each 20%, the top bucket was the best. The most investment you had in wide receiver, you did the best. And it scaled down appropriately. So I almost think like it's... It's like it's like a super flex league with quarterback with the scarcity with the three wide receiver positions. If you're playing in a super flex league, to a certain extent, it, it doesn't matter at all like whether the league is right on where the QBs should be valued or whether you're right. Like you have to be somewhat tethered to the market, right? Like right, you, right. Like exactly. if you get completely shut out, even if you you can scream off the top of your head that they overvalue <laughs> quarterbacks, but you're 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 dusted, right? Like right. So I think wide receiver is somewhat similar. I think this year there's more opportunities because of like the elite tight ends falling, like we mentioned. And like, even like someone like Derek Henry in round four and half PPR, right? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I, we're like, we don't really particularly like Derek Henry, but like round four, you know, you, you did that with three wide receiver build. You can see it. You can see Laporte in round. So I think you can mix and match, but you definitely can't like, Everyone's like, oh, zig while, you know, everyone zags. It's like, you can't totally do that. You have to keep up to a certain extent. It's really hard early. Like at, at the one, two turn, it's like, if I take Jameer Gibbs and the draft breaks perfectly, it's fine. If I don't take Jameer Gibbs or if I take Jameer Gibbs and it doesn't break perfectly, like I'm like, God, I really wish I had just double tap wide receiver at yeah. the one, two turn. So in those first three rounds in particular, I'd like to lean into wide receiver because there, like, like if you have like a quote unquote wide receiver avalanche, you can only get so far behind the first three rounds. Like, there's just so many players, you're going to get some good players. So, I like to kind of ensure that I'm not going to be in one of those bottom wide receiver buckets by investing in a few wide receivers very early. But then I'm willing to deviate from there, like, based on the value. Like, I'll still go wide receiver times five at times, but I'm definitely okay deviating from there. So I, I'm I'm obviously looking at what my individual rooms are doing and trying to extract value based on, you know, does this guy have this stack, whatever? Can I get this quarterback? Can I squeeze out more value and wait for the quarterback? One thing that I don't really do enough of, though, is like really analyze uh, how frequently teams are not going wide receiver heavy. What I mean by that is like like you studying the the investment of wide receivers historically, right? And how last yeah. year, for instance, the teams that were really heavy wide receiver that in, that put a lot of capital in wide receiver, they did the best. For some context, the teams that did the worst, like are they like going with one wide receiver through seven rounds? Are they, you know, is it is it a situation where, you know, like, because I, I want to bring it into how we're already drafting at a baseline, right? And how I'm yeah. drafting, how people listening to this probably are drafting, where we're all probably getting three or four wide receivers through round six, right? Like, like it's just like naturally already doing it. And so I'm trying to say, you know, are we supposed to be heavier than that? Are we, or can we be a little bit lighter than that? What is the comparison to some of these teams that are essentially dead when they don't go wide receiver heavy? Yeah, I didn't break it down exactly like how they're achieving these capital buckets because like yeah. you could achieve it by like taking 10 wide receivers in the middle rounds versus right, like right. six early. And there's some reasons I do it that way, but you do lose some of the nuance that you're mentioning now to let, that gives you like a better feel for exactly how to implement that. So I want to look mm -hmm. into it a little bit more. But in general, I think these teams that are... You know, you know, Hayden Winks of Underdogs done a lot of research that's kind of like four wide receivers by round seven. Is sort yeah. of like, and I think yeah. that's sort of like your minimum threshold. Like there's obviously some nuance and some wrinkles to that, but like, I think if you're drafting four by round seven, sometimes I'll only have three by round seven. If it's three, the first three rounds and there's some feel to it. I think you're, you're okay. I think when you get in trouble is like, let's say you went CMC with the first overall pick. You took a chan at the two three turn and then maybe you you deviated at tight end and now you've you've your wide receiver investment is just like one guy at the two three turn one guy at the four five turn like yeah. 
even if you get to four, it's probably a little bit dicey, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, before I let you go, two players you're targeting, two players you're avoiding. I know that you'll have probably exposure to almost everyone. So I, I don't want to say yeah. that you're fading the avoids or, you know, overly target, you know, you're going to have 50% exposure to the targets, but two guys you're generally going after and two guys you're generally not going after. So Kyle Pitts is a guy that I'm targeting quite a bit. I think that this Atlanta offense, people have obviously adjusted to what we're going to see with the year over year coaching change and quarterback change. But I think to an extent they may have not adjusted enough. Like this is a team that, you know, plays a lot of dome games and a somewhat weak division that's going from one of the most run heavy offenses in the league to probably, you know, a neutral to above average pass rate. And you've also got a quarterback, you know, we had quarterbacks in Mariota historically, Desmond Ritter, Heineke, dudes who would scramble a little bit and take sacks. You don't get that with Kirk Cousins. You know, he's not going to yeah. scramble. You know, most of his dropbacks yeah, yeah. are turning into pass attempts. So, right. And I think with Pitts, there might have been some health stuff last year. He's still really young. Like if you compare him to these other like McBride yeah. and like Laporte and these guys, like Pitts is still really young. And I'm not quite ready yet to throw out his prospect status and that amazing rookie season. So yeah. he's someone that I like a lot, especially because you can get him in round six a lot of times and have gotten, you know, three wide receivers plus, you know, either a fourth or another position. So he's yeah. one of the he he lines of, he lines he lines up with Drake London too from an ADP perspective to stack Falcons pretty easily. Yeah, and if you get both, you can really push that cousin stack a lot because people right. really aren't taking right. a naked cousin. So you can get cousins at a really good value. So he's someone that I'm targeting. Um I generally usually don't have like a super hot take very early in the drafts, but I do find myself getting a lot of Devontae Smith. I think that this Philly offense in general and his ADP has come up a little bit. We were like crazy yeah. ahead for a while and the markets like matched us a little bit, but I think Philly in general, there's some recency bias in how they ended last season that is affecting things. And I just think they have a really talented team, like a good organization. They bring in Callum yep. Moore, who's going to continue to, I think scheme these guys open and also run at a really fast pace, which is something Philly's done year in and year out so that the play count is going to be really high and i just think Devonte smith and aj brown are like really talented wide receivers and maybe the gap between those two is is larger than it should be so i like Devonte smith a lot at the two three turn i know you like jalen waddle like those two guys the two three turn you know for a while i think we had a discount where they weren't like that great last year and people were kind of sick of them markets coming around to those two but definitely targets yeah. for me well, there's also, uh, you know, something in the late round draft guide that I uh, looked at and I talk about is people will seem to be a little bit afraid of the of the wide receiver twos. So like wide receivers rank 13th to 24th that are team wide receiver twos, you know, so Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle. Historically, those guys have actually given you better results than the alternative, than, than the wide receiver team wide receiver ones that are being drafted in that wide receiver two range. Now, part of that is just because they're talented and they're good. That's why they're able to still be drafted that high with a stud on their team. But then there's also the contingent upside factor, right? Like if 100%. if if, Ty if Tyreek Hill goes down, Jalen Waddle is probably going to be projected for like a 28 to 30 percent target share in that offense. And Devontae Smith, you'd see a and we've seen that with Devontae Smith, uh, you know, where, where you're going to get a huge spike in target share projection. And I, I think that often goes um, you know, uh, just just is ignored at times with those players. What about two players that that you're not that into that you're kind of avoiding? So I have very little George Pickens through my early drafts. Um, that's one where I, I get like when people look at the on off splits without Deontay Johnson, they kind of like talk themselves into this really high target share. I'm a little bit concerned if he can earn you know the levels that the market's assuming. I'm a little bit concerned with the team pass rate. I'm a little bit concerned with the quarterback play. He's one of the wide receivers that's been boosted up really, really early in this environment that, you know, I have a tough time getting behind yeah. and, you know, he's going kind of like early fourth right now. So it's a little rich for my blood. 
Yeah, I I was a little bit more into him in like May, and I was drafting him. I I basically haven't drafted him over the last like three weeks because not not only has wi- have wide receiver prices just risen in general, and we've seen some of those like later fourth guys, like you said, going in the early fourth more. But it goes back to like a lot of the guys in the fourth round. I don't have a lot of non tight end expo you know, like as much non tight end exposure to because that's where you know a lot of these really good tight ends are going, and I'm just opting for that kind of build more frequently. Another player that's, I guess, a harder fade to swallow, but I don't have a ton of CJ Stroud right now. And I'm trying to do this like objective. Like, I don't want to say that, but I look at CJ Stroud compared to like Dak Prescott, for example, and I don't see a huge difference there. And the gap is almost three full rounds. So I'm only drafting Stroud. Uh, you're generally only drafting him if it's stacked anyways. Like I think everybody's doing that, but I want it stacked and like around after ADP. And even then I feel like I'm reaching to where he should go, but I'm willing to do that then just to not have zero exposure. But he's someone that looks really overpriced. I think Dak, Burrow, you know, Trevor Lawrence, like some of these guys later are like really just much better picks at at cost. That's the the pocket passer trap episode I did a a couple weeks ago where when you get these high-end QB ones who are largely pocket passers, there's a lot more variation with their projection and and how they perform because touchdown rate, passing numbers, a lot more volatile than rushing numbers are. And so we often see a high-end QB two, a Trevor Lawrence, which is the example that I like to use, Trevor Lawrence or a Tua, or even like maybe you can throw like a Purdy in there or a Goff or something like that. You can get one of them and and get close to matching Stroud, but if you get two of them, you're going to succeed in you know, probability wise in exceeding what a player like Stroud is going to end up performing. That's more from a season long perspective. One of those guys is going to outperform CJ Stroud. That's what we've seen historically whenever we have these pocket passers. So I really like the Stroud thing before I let you go though, about Stroud, is there, is there some concern and you know, you said that you want to get some exposure. Is that concern that you have in that comment that you made more so the fact that you know that he has weekly upside, like, you know, that in a given week, CJ Stroud could win that week. What if that week is week 17? What if that week is one of these playoff weeks where he could hypothetically blow up? Is that why you would want that exposure in case that one thing could happen? I think it's less because of that. I think at some point you just got to accept the risk that like there's a guy who's overvalued that has a high weekly ceiling, George Pickens being one of them that like if they beat me at the wrong time, like kind of so be it. Um, With Stroud, it's more that he's had one of the best rookie quarterback seasons ever. They bring in Stefan Diggs and maybe that pass rate lever for them gets pushed up where they just trust him a lot more. You know, Mahomes is one of those pocket passers that we're okay taking early because they're top three in pass rate over expectation every single season. Well, they're pretty much top um, in pass rate over expectation. For Stroud, one of the reasons to be concerned is like they weren't, they were negative pass rate over expectation last year, right? Like they just, they were kind of neutral. They were just crazy efficient. But if they did take like a big leap forward there and then he kind of enters more like the Mahomes tier is sort of the concern for me. So if I have a Houston pass catcher and I'm kind of banking on that offense being really successful, I don't mind Stroud. But again, even then I'm like taking him more like picks like 70 to 80 as opposed to 60. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Leone, man, I really appreciate you hopping on, dropping some knowledge. Uh, let everyone know where they can find you and all the awesome stuff you're doing with best ball, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. Like, always love chatting with you, man. Um, but yeah, you can check out all my stuff over at Establish to Run. I'm working on an update to the best ball manifesto that I wrote last year, kind of updating it for the current payout structures and the data from Best Ball Mania 4. Also, doing some episodes on the podcast that's part of the established run network, but it's kind of my podcast uh, on establish the edge. So check those out if you want some really niche best ball content. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Obviously I've had a lot of ETR folks on the podcast throughout, you know, the last handful of years, you guys are buddies of mine, not just because you're awesome people, but you do great, great work as well. As always, you can find my stuff over on late Late round draft guide. It will be out next week. So make sure you pre order that. There's also, you can use promo code late round over on underdog and get that thing for free. You'll get emailed the copy of the guide on July 1st when that drops. But otherwise, everyone, thank you for tuning in.